say the can has been kicked down the road. Now cash reserves are low or near exhausted for many companies and credit facilities are beginning to come due. I think there's a little optimism uh, that things are going to improve significantly over, say, the next year. We heard uh, several panelists this morning talk about maybe 2014, but there didn't seem to be a lot of optimism for 2013. Um, so many shipping companies, I would say, are now facing the bullet. Uh, and they need a proactive strategy uh, that will enable them to continue operations through the end of the downturn uh, to the eventual recovery. Uh, I think in some cases the strategy could be to sell the company or close the company and get out, but in most cases I think the strategy is going to involve some form of restructuring uh, where some cash will be raised, uh, some existing uh, obligations may be reduced, extended, or even eliminated. Uh, in other words, restructuring of the company that will return the company to sort of the zone of, of solvency uh, and allow it to resume normal operations with the real potential for full recovery and future growth. So uh, the topic of our panel this morning, as Kevin said, is, is how to manage and control the restructuring. It's a very challenging question, but fortunately, uh, we've assembled a panel of experts here to help us sort it out. Uh, so starting down at this end, uh, we've got Glenn Peters and Ernst & Young. Uh, here we have Ak uh, Akulis uh, Prokopakis, who is... Uh, the Senior Vice President and COO of Denouse Corporation, and then we've got Carlton Seidel uh, of Deloitte, and then finally there uh, we've got Helm Malone, uh, who is with Jeffries. Um, so guys, what I've got here uh, is, uh, is an outline of some questions, and I'm going to throw them out there. Uh, and anybody can answer who's got a thought on it, or maybe I'll, I'll call on somebody. But uh, I want to take a moment at the beginning and just sort of define the topic of a restructuring, uh, because it's something different than a refinancing. What, what does a restructuring, uh, what makes it different than um, just an ordinary refinancing or capital raise? Um, Glenn? <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, what would you say to that? When, when does a company uh, need a restructuring?
so as we talk about timing and, and when it's sort of necessary to begin the process, can some of you comment on how long this process is likely to take? I know it's different in every situation, but I think if a company understands it's going to take a certain period of time, they, they might be motivated to start earlier. Carl, would you like to comment? Certainly. I mean, in, in our experience, um, this is a four to nine month minimum term process for a consensual deal to be thought of, developed, delivered, documented, which is not an, uh, not an inconsiderable exercise. Um, so it is that kind of period of time that you have to be in advance of the, uh, the wave crashing over the uh, bow, so to speak, that uh, many other things was referring to. So um, I think it is about having that quality of management information so that the company can actually view and see that, in, that, see that inevitability and therefore devise a plan to avoid it. Thank you. So, so let's say that the company is looking at its forecast and it realizes that, um, you know, six months, 12 months down the road, it's, you know, there, there's a problem but, but no obvious solution. Uh, they need to, to think about restructuring. Um, who organizes and, and runs a restructuring? How do you get started? How can you come out? I think one of the things you talked about was each situation being different. I, I think we can certainly agree that, you know, ideally we're looking out six to 12 months um, in their opposite range where one of them that was uh, touched the horn was, uh, you know, an imminent cash uh, uh, shortfall. I think maturities are increasingly becoming, um, you know, topical in the industry uh, as opposed to, to, say, a covenant default, um, you know, as well as the potential for counterparties to, to certain, uh, you know, certain contracts to, to act. Um, you know, we would certainly view it as generally being incumbent upon, um, you know, management to have a sort of system to, of control. So we would um, generally advise people to be proactive in terms of seeking to maintain control of the process and the discussions um, themselves. You never uh, or want to avoid having a counterpart and be able to force action either through uh, declaring a default with the covenant or someone on the other side of the charter being able to arrest a ship or a supplier arrest a ship. So, uh, you know, certainly we would, we would hope management would, uh, would be, uh, be proactive in terms of initiating the process, um, you know, generally with a discussion of, um, of what all terms may be with, the, with who the key stakeholders are and, and uh, depending on maybe an initial discussion to determine whether or not they want to bring in a legal advisor, financial advisor, or uh, financial professional of some sort to help with um, transparency, et cetera. So there are a whole range of other options. Uh, you mentioned the financial advisor, uh, and I just wanted to, to, to raise that issue. I, I think in most restructurings there there is a financial advisor. Would it be more or let me just ask I'm the situation in one year from I mean uh, I'm sure you have a financial advisor involved in your restructuring. You sitting next to me here. Maybe not you exactly was you with well, we we were involved but uh, I think the company had uh, some additional advisors as well so we managed to work together which I think was quite an important element to uh, what happened in that I think I think the voice to your left is a more powerful one. Yeah, well, I, the question I wanted to throw out there is the need to involve a financial advisor. It seems that it, it, there wants to be one in every case, but uh, what is it? Well, by the time you think that a structure might be necessary, the next moment you have to try a financial advisor. And a financial advisor will provide the technical support will ensure the fairness of the decisions and the plans will be provided, but the management has to front, generate, and defend in all times the structure. I think you put it very well when you talked about generating, presenting, and defending the plan. I want to talk just a minute about the importance of planning and forecasting to a uh, successful restructuring because one of the things that the company is going to need to do is to convince its creditors and other stakeholders that they have a plan in place that can succeed. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there. Uh, Linda, I want to comment on um, the process and importance of, of planning and forecasting and credibility. How would you Sure. I, 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 mean, I think one of the challenges this industry has in restructuring relative to others is uh, less visibility in many cases um, in terms of what the future financial performance of the business um, may be, particularly in increasing situations. 
amount bigger was the energy. So credibility is an historical thing, but it is maintained during the process, among other things that they have been stated here, technical things, through the identification of the alliances. Okay, that, that, that actually provides a very good segue here. Um, at some point, um, the company does need to approach the various stakeholders, and these will usually include uh, senior lenders who are typically secured, at least in the shipping industry in most cases, possibly junior secured lenders. You've got unsecured creditors, and you've got contract counterparties, and then you've got your or ordinary, if you will, shareholders. So there's, there's many different uh, classes of stakeholders there. Um, my question is, is, is there a logical order to approaching these various stakeholders, uh, or uh, do you put everybody in, in a room and begin to talk? Um, who wants to take a shot at that? How do you approach the stakeholders? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the points that, that was just touched upon was, you know, I, I think a need is the process to find, you know, find a friend or find, uh, you know, find a partner um, in, uh, in the process. Sometimes that's, you know, very evident uh, who that's going to be from the start. Often it evolves throughout, um, you know, the start of the, the start of uh, process as you get into people's interests, um, interest shifts. And so, you know, typically we, we would uh, suggest not to start with everyone in, uh, in one room. I think you want to uh, identify the different stakeholders and, and very early find a friend, um, you know, in the process to be your partner in, in working. Um, with the other stakeholders, often that's somebody who's prepared to provide additional capital uh, or make concessions, um, you know, from their position to uh, to drive a transaction. And you know, I think back to the credibility point. You know, people are are, are receptive to managements that are proactive and are proposing um, solutions that are realistic to the challenges they face, as opposed to let's you know have a meeting. Uh, talk about what the problem is without having a, uh, a solution. I, I think we're, we're seeing certainly among many of the lenders that they're dealing with so many challenges these days that um, you know you need to go with, to them with a solution that they can react to. They're, they're not uh, in many cases in a position to propose a proposing uh, I want to talk about the senior lender group in particular because shipping companies often have large credit facilities and these are syndicated and so um, you're sitting down, if you will, with, with maybe 10 different uh, banks that are involved in the syndicate. Um, how, how do you approach that group? To start with, you have to identify the aims or the targets of each of the state stakeholders. And um, you prepare a plan which is the plan A, which is really a plan to maintain the interest of all stakeholders. And you present your plan to the senior lenders on an individual basis. What do you mean by an individual basis? One by one. You mean one by one separately. And communicate to them what you believe that it should be done. That's how at least we start. I mean, I, I think there is there is no defined formula in terms of what is the best way to approach these things, but usually there is a, a formal channel of communication of dealing with a syndicate of vendors and that will, I mean, the, the syndicate will usually organize themselves to have a small group of banks that will represent the broad syndicate. Um, but, but I think there's also an equal challenge, I think is, is what, what the arrangements are saying, is that, that quite often there's regular side discussions um, going on with all the lenders within the group to ensure that, that you know, the right messages are getting across and that the company is doing business. Yes, later in the process, um, of course, uh, you communicate to everyone and the process gets started. But before you really start the formal process, you have to have the view, the positioning, and the 
opinion of the senior slender uh, that they are the main the stakeholders in this process. Okay, cash, some kind of cash infusion is usually part of the restructuring as well. Not, not in every case necessarily, but generally speaking, uh, there's some cash brought into the company through asset sales or a fresh investment. Um, first of all, I guess my question is, do, do you agree that that's typically the case? And my second question is, you know, where can you find money today? The capital markets being the way they are, the, the, the commercial banks being how they are. What's the best place uh, to look for capital? If we could answer that, I don't think we'd be here. Um, I, I, think, I think there are opportunities and there are investors who are expressing and, and have expressed increasing interest in the shipping industry, particularly over the last 12 to 15 months. I guess you would question their motives and you would question the, uh, the vulture fund type approach that, that, that is waiting to effectively call the bottom of the market. Um, I think there are different strategies that the lenders have and it's important to understand those alongside understanding their collateral positions so you know what their, what their likely responses are not going to be. Um, um, so there are the traditional sources. There is the emergence of private equity, I would say, as a potential source, but that's, that's a very dangerous bedfellow and um, owners need to be um, aware of the potential pitfalls of, uh, of uh, Joining, joining forces with private equity. Um, but uh, I, I would say that there are opportunities where, where, where the story is constructed and is robust and has the information that, uh, that traditional capital sources would look for, then there are, there are still opportunities despite the challenges facing the industry, let like alone individual companies within the industry. Yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would add to that. I would, I would certainly say we. we are regularly approached, you know, probably several times a week by some new source that's looking to enter the industry. Um, so far, there's been, um, you know, not as much activity as I think people uh, on the other side of the table would have expected from a couple of years ago that people have been looking. Um, you know, I, I think you may start to see a little bit greater velocity um, of some of that as people's um, challenge to become more cash oriented as opposed to. Um, Purely, purely covenant or maturity, uh, or maturity driven. Um, but um, you know, one of the one of the you know challenges that that you have seen is um, not having a lot of people within the current capital structures that are looking to deploy additional capital into the sector. I think you have a number of senior lenders that are um, looking to manage their portfolios uh, downwards, but looking to extend additional capital. And as you see potentially new parties entering the capital structures um, that have an appetite to addition, invest additional capital. I think you'll start to see more restructurings be built around um, built around those kind of situations as opposed to uh, looking to the existing shareholders or to bring in uh, a new party to the capital structure. Always your best source of capital is, um, or generally your best source of capital is someone who's uh, already an existing party um, and has an interest in, in, uh, in contributing additional capital to outside solutions. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I thought that uh, in my view, equity, equity contribution is a must in order to have the process to succeed. Uh, it will be impossible, or at least almost impossible, without an equity contribution, the process to go through. Uh, for us, it was from the beginning that the sponsoring shareholder committed his willingness to contribute. Now, strategically, when and how much is another issue. It is a matter that you will decide during the process. But the commitment of equity is a must. Uh, we recently saw uh, a, a bankruptcy in which uh, the lender group took over control of the company, got a lot of press, and um, we all know that, that lenders don't want to be ship owners, but uh, I think there was a thought that we may be seeing more of this. Um, can somebody comment on the circumstances under which the lender group might find themselves accepting equity in the restructuring? Why, why does that happen, and, and, and how does the lender group feel about that? Well, I mean, I, I think you're starting to see mentalities change, you know, within, uh, you know, within the industry and specifically within groups. You know, I think many of the lenders uh, that you've now seen take equity, and there've been a couple of situations where I told you, uh, certainly two years ago, that that was not, uh, you know, not something, um, you know, that they would uh, that they would ever uh, that they would ever consider. Uh, I think 
given how the industry has evolved, um, you're really seeing a, uh, a seeking for people to uh, have a path to ultimately recovering all of their capital. Um, and uh, as, that, uh, as that becomes about uh, working with existing stakeholders, and then I think the two circumstances where you've seen the banks take equity in the public, there have been stakeholders in the form of people that had chartered investments that also uh, were very constructive to the process. And so I think that's clearly been an example where you've seen the banks uh, be more willing to accept equity because it's being done so in partnership with other uh, other creditors. But, but we would increasingly expect to see that be um, an ingredient going forward, particularly now that the banks have shown uh, it's something that they are prepared to do in certain circumstances as opposed to it being a off-limits um, option, uh, you know, six to twelve months ago. Is it fair to say that it's a last resort for the banks when when uh, when the parties look at the company and its prospects and there doesn't appear to be a, another type of restructuring that, that that's possible? Is that a fair comment or is that too simplistic? Uh, but I think it's necessarily a last resort. <laughs> I mean, usually the last resort is some form of check, uh, chapter 11 or, or some form of insolvency. Um, but, but clearly, if if there are limited options and the banks are uh, effectively being asked to take equity risk um, through their debt, then it typically banks will want to receive uh, equity in return for that. Um, but it's only, I think, in certain circumstances where that will actually be possible for banks to do that, because there are quite a lot of challenges around around banks being able to accept equity um, as a form of compensation. Good point. Uh, well, we, you know, we've gotten quite far into this discussion of restructuring, and nobody's mentioned the word bankruptcy. Just Clint just mentioned, uh, you know, possibly a, a chapter eleven or seven proceeding, but bankruptcy may or may not be part of the restructuring process. It's, it's uh, wonderful in a way when it, when it isn't. That shows the parties worked together and they found a solution. But um, it often is part of the process. So I want to throw the question out there. You know, what are the main benefits of bankruptcy and, and why would a, uh, a company go choose to go through the bankruptcy process? Who wants to take a step down? Oh, I, I think I think the first point that, that Glenn made was you know that it, that that's generally a last resort, uh, and, and that's certainly our view. I think a lot of the uh, restructuring process evolves around um, stakeholders understanding what the different alternative paths may be and what the uh, what the benefits for um, and the risk for each of those uh, each of those paths may be. I think the circumstances where we've seen. Uh, banks take uh, take equity back. I think that was facilitated by the companies generally being publicly listed, which made that uh, made that interesting. Uh, but also in evaluating that relative to other alternatives, including the terms in which they could attract fresh capital or what the outcome and cost may be of a uh, of a Chapter 11 or other restructuring proceedings. I, I think when you when you see that um, be something that's been a, that's, uh, that is an alternate people should strongly consider is something when there is a surprise uh, action taken by uh, one party that uh, that sort of process provides protection about. So if you see someone arrest a ship or move to enforce, uh, you know, clearly uh, filing for some sort of protection puts a freeze on that process. Uh, you know, it also provides in certain circumstances an ability to uh, adjust uh, contracts, um, you know, which may be a liability which can be beneficial to um, uh, to other parties in the capital structure as well, where you have a different layer of capital structures. And I think one of the things that is important in the senior lenders is that you often have not just syndicates, but you have often multiple syndicates in different collateral um, positions.
land being a means and a forum for ongoing discussion. So I would suggest that the use of more, more of a pre-packaged approach where the deal is actually struck beforehand and to the extent that you have resistant stakeholders, then the delivery mechanism is used to enforce that or to reinforce that proposal. Um, it is, is an effective and proper use of, of the insolvency process, whereas going into a Chapter 11 and then having a debate about how to run a, 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 a live and active shipping company, I think is, uh, is a recipe for disaster and uh, should be avoided at absolutely all costs. Anyone else like to uh, comment on that? Just to ask a question, I mean, uh, from the standpoint of expectations, um, should a company facing a restructuring expect that bankruptcy at some point might be part of it as a delivery mechanism or otherwise, or is it just a case-by-case -case basis? I think, it, I think you know, it's, every case is different and every case will have its own dynamics. Um, but I think one of the things I'm seeing more and more often is one of the first questions that lenders will ask is what's our risk of a chapter 11 filing? Um, so I think it's become such a prevalent issue in the market that, that banks are pretty quick these days to understand um, you know, what, what the potential threat is from a bankruptcy. Now, there, there have been some high-profile cases that have become running sub-offers in the trade press, one in particular down in Houston. But uh, I, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's uh, put a little bit of fear into the bank. You know, they might find themselves in a similar situation, a more protracted situation. Um, okay, um, <coughs> kind of coming to the end of our, our, uh, our time slot here, so I wanted to just wrap it up with, with a couple of very general questions for the panel here. Um, and I'll just throw this out um, for all our panelists. Um, what would you say are some of the things that, uh, that company management often fails to anticipate about a restructuring process? something that, that, that might surprise them as they go through it. Uh, anybody have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, um, my experience is the big underestimation is the amount of management resource and time taken to orchestrate and to control the restructuring. You are taken away from your day job for vast tracts of time and having a good team, a team that is robust enough to maintain the operation whilst you are focused on that survival and delivery of the survival is absolutely critical. Yeah, I think it's a good point and it goes to the question of retaining a financial consultant and other, other advisors because it's in a way a new job and it's also one that you don't necessarily have experience for. Uh, if I, 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 I would echo that and I, I, mean, I think the amount of, of information, particularly for private companies that people seek and is sort of, you know, often we'll have a conversation with someone and they'll be resistant to provide information. There's a lot of convincing that look, that's kind of part of the process. And I, I think one of the other things that people are often surprised about um, that was touched upon earlier is who turns out to be their best friends in the process and, and who, uh, who ends up taking positions that would be unexpected to go in. And it's often uh, the last person you would have expected uh, to start the process that turns out to be your best friend in getting something uh, something done. So don't um, go into the process with preconceived notions as to how um, people are going to react because I think people are quite often surprised. Correct. As you went, went through the process, was there something that surprised you? Right from the result, uh, it seems that we had everything being anticipated. So we did very well, um, I think. But um, I think I have, I have answered this uh, question before. During the process sometimes, and I have to repeat this over again, you find that some of your best friends, for their own reasons, might tend to be your worst enemies. And this is a surprise. That, that's an intriguing comment. I mean, what do you think causes that? Um, is it the need to get out to, to uh, or their own issues about cash? What do you think cause uh, unexpected enemies to emerge? 
Shipping 
balance to be struck there between the buying of time and the right sizing of the business. Because there is a need at some stage to recognise that the market recovery is either not going to come in time, and in order to do that, you need to understand the cash position, be it debt maturity, be it operational cash flows, or alternatively, you need to be able to appreciate that there is a need for a strategic change within the business in order to redirect that business. And that requires something more painful than an extended maternity approach. Yeah. And, I, and I would add to that, I mean, if, if you are a company that's in a situation where you bought ships at the height of the market, you know, when the whole freight rates were going to be low, that it would be compensatory for those kinds of investments, I think that it's not easily foreseeable. Kevin, I think that aiming to buy time is uh, a means of restructuring the process. It's a bit dangerous. Uh, timing is always extremely important to shipping, but in this case, at least lenders would like to know and to have definite things. So the model has to be sustainable for a long period of time. You cannot have a model which will adjust itself on the basis of shipping cycles. Do we have one more question? 